Hillsong East Coast, welcome to church. We're so excited you're here with us. Last day of January, you made it, congratulations. If you're joining us for the 10 a.m., make sure you hop in the chat um, and join service along with us. And a shout out to our incredible volunteers that make everything happen, Church Online. If you join us in the chat, we actually have people rostered to send service notes. They tell us what song's next. It's pretty awesome. They're kind of my 411 for church. Tomorrow is the first day of February and we are so excited to launch our Black History Month website. You can check out the link starting tomorrow. Our team has prepared special events throughout the month. We're so excited to learn and celebrate. So make sure you check that out. I'm so excited for that. Well, church, every week we spend time in worship. So I wanna encourage you right now, whatever that looks like for you, whether you're at home, you're on your couch, you're maybe you're still in bed, no judgment here. Lift up your hands, sing out loud. Let's prepare our hearts and receive the word and worship together. So let me pray for us. God, I just thank you so much. Um, we thank you for this service. We thank you that you are in our midst. We feel your presence right now, even though we're scattered across our living rooms, um, at our workplaces, wherever we are watching. God, I pray that you'll prepare our hearts as we receive your word and as we worship together. In your name we pray, amen. the hardest heart Speak life into my soul Who can spin the world around And hold me up close Who can search the depths of me Love me to the core oh, oh, oh. Who controls the world I see Walks me through it all
standing here in your presence in a grace so relentless i am one by perfect love wrapped within the arms of heaven in a peace that lasts forever sinking deep in mercy see i'm wide awake drawing closer by grace and all my heart is yours i feel
Well, thank you, Jesus. I know that we need worship right now and we also need prayer. And I just wanna take a moment and say thank you to our church family and to our community and volunteers who help us make church happen week in and week out. I am so grateful for you. Right now, we're gonna take a moment and we're gonna to pray together. We need a lot of prayer right now. We are going through a difficult time as a church, inside of church and outside of church. It feels like there are challenges coming at us from every side, but how many know when the valley is dark and long, our God is faithful through it. Do you know this, that we can look to heaven because the Bible says that's where our help comes from. So right now we are gonna look to heaven. I wanna let you know that one of our staff members, Darnell Barrett this week, lost his brother in a tragic car accident, leaving three small children behind. We're gonna lift up the Barrett family right now. And we're also gonna lift up all those that have lost somebody during this challenging time. We're gonna be praying for our church. We're gonna to stand together. But I want you to know, I don't just pray in public on this camera or on a screen. I pray in private as well. And I believe our most powerful prayers aren't sometimes heard by anyone, but they're deep inside of our souls and our hearts and God will speak to us. So even right now, I pray that God would do something supernatural in your heart and your mind and that you would know as you pray, God hears your prayers. He hears from heaven and I believe he's gonna heal our church and heal our land like never before. So Jesus, right now we come together collectively. We hold spiritual hands together and God, we say, would you please bring comfort to the Barrett family? God, we pray for for them as they experience this tragic loss. God, I pray that you would comfort them, that you'd be the God of healing, that you'd be the God of protection, that you'd protect their minds, their souls, and their hearts during this challenging season. God, we pray for these small children, God. God, that you would be a father to the fatherless. God, that you'd come alongside them and you'd help them. God, we stand together. We link arm in arm and we stand for this family. We ask you to help them. And God, we stand with others that are going through tremendously difficult times, God. Sometimes there's a loss of a loved one, but other times it's a it's a loss of hope, a loss of job, it's a loss of finances, it's a loss of, of feeling like there's a future. God, I pray that you would restore what the enemy has stolen. God, I pray that a sense of peace and grace and hope and light would penetrate every single heart and mind today. And God, I thank you that our best days are ahead of us as a church. God, even when we can't see it, even when it seems dark, God, I pray for our church. I pray for our community right now. I pray for our church family that you'd look after them. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, right now we normally take a moment and we talk to those who give financially week in and week out and you tithe regularly. And we want to say thank you to those who do that. And I want to thank you for your courageous giving during this season. I know it has not been easy. I also want to address something else. This week, there have been some accusations about the stewardship of our tithe and how we utilize that tithe and how it's brought into our house and where it goes and what it's being spent on. I want you to know that we take these accusations very seriously. I've been informed that Pastor Brian Houston, our global senior pastor, will be sending an email tomorrow morning to our entire church globally, letting us, letting us know the policies and practices that we have in place and we've had in place for over 30 years to look after our finances well and steward what God has ultimately given us. We do not take this lightly and we want you to be on the lookout for that email. And if you have any questions, please, any questions whatsoever, please come to us and you can click on this email below and find out more information or you can ask questions, any questions that you have regarding how we handle finances, especially on the East Coast and within your campus. And beyond that, please, I always want to encourage you, check out our annual report. We're very proud of it as a church on the East Coast. Since 2017, we have decided to put together this annual report to talk to you about how we are stewarding our finances so that we can reach and help the people in our communities and our church so people can find hope in Jesus and hope through the light of the gospel. We want you to please check that out at our website. There's a 2019 report that just came out and we're working on our 2020 report as we speak. And right now we're gonna hear from Pastor Brian. He's gonna tell us a little bit about our future and what's coming up in the life of church on the East Coast. I'm really looking forward to this update. 
And then after that, Pastor Matt Barges from our New Jersey campus is going to be bringing the word. I am so grateful for Matt. You know, he has had some seasoned words, even to me personally in this season. I'm so grateful for his life. I'm so grateful for his leadership. And I'm so grateful that today I believe that he has a word that's timely on uh, for our church. So lean into this message and check out this quick message from Pastor Brian. We love you, church. We are with you. And together we can get through this. We got to keep our eyes on Jesus and our best days are ahead of us. Well, to all our friends at Hillsong East Coast, thank God for you. And we've obviously been through a very stormy few months. But Bobby and I, we pray for you all the time. We pray for you every day. My wife, as you may know, is a prayer and she goes to battle in the heavenlies. And I know she's been doing that for our beautiful church in the East Coast. And I just wanted to let you know that we've been being very diligent, as diligent as we can be at building the right foundation for our church in East Coast, in New York and Boston and Connecticut and, uh, and, and of course Montclair. And I'm confident that we've got good days coming. We have been very, very prayerful about who is going to lead the church moving forward. And I'm hoping, I'm expecting actually that, well, within the next two or three weeks, we'll make that announcement. I think you're going to be blessed and excited. So stay with us, keep engaging, keep praying for your own church. Pray for John and John Tamini, that is, and Talu as they've been helping us and guiding the church through these seasons, through this season, through these times. And uh, well, I'm looking forward to being able to declare to you very soon uh, just the direction we're believing to go for the leadership for our church. And then we can move onwards and upwards and in to all that God has for us. There's still many people to be saved. There's still many people to come to Christ. There's still many things that God wants to do in people's lives. What you're part of is valuable and you are valuable being part of it. So we love you. We'll, you'll keep hearing from us and a big announcement won't be far away. Be blessed. Church, it is an honor anytime uh, I'm given the opportunity to share around the Word of God and preach what I feel He has placed on my heart. So I'm going to do exactly that this morning, this afternoon, whenever it is that you're tuning in with us. And I'm going to believe with you that God is going to use this time that we have together and He is going to move in your life. And I want to say right now, if you're new, visiting um, to our YouTube or Facebook or wherever you're watching this from, we just want you to know that we love you. And maybe you've never had a chance to join us in one of our services, but we are so honored that you would join with us today. And I want you to know that we believe what this Bible says. We believe who Jesus is, who he says he is. And we believe that he wants to move not only in our lives, but in your life right now. So we're going to lean into this moment. I'm going to read today out of the Gospel of Mark. It's in chapter 8. Start off in verse 27. If you have your Bible, great. Obviously, our amazing team is going to put it up on the screen so you can follow along. But it says this in, in verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Just for the record, that's the right answer, okay? Uh, Jesus uh, warned them not to tell anyone about him. Go down to verse 31. It says, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man, that's just a phrase that is used oftentimes throughout Scripture. It comes from the book of Daniel. Jesus uses this to refer to himself as the messianic figure. It says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Just for the record, um, Peter often is the example of what not to do. Um, rebuking Jesus, not a good idea. Just want to throw that out there. But when Jesus it says, when Jesus looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. In verse 34, and this is, this is what I really want to focus in on for today's message, it says, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. 
What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. I don't know about you, um, but that passage can be a little bit uncomfortable. Go ahead and raise your hand right now if you're like, hey, that sounds kind of good. Jesus is the Messiah, and also um, he might be ashamed if I don't do the right things, and it feels kind of awkward. I'm supposed to carry a cross. Crosses don't sound that inviting. Um, it's a little uncomfortable. But you know, sometimes we have to embrace what often is an uncomfortable truth. I believe that this year, um, no doubt, has been a year where we have all learned and been forced to embrace some uncomfortable truths about life. Um, an uncomfortable truth that I've recently come to embrace is the fact that Crocs are the most comfortable and convenient shoes available to mankind. Now, my wife strongly disagrees with me. You may strongly disagree with me. Um, doesn't change the fact. The reality is my wife often, she, she was really discouraged because I ordered my first pair of Crocs and she is, is kind of concerned. She thinks I've given up on life. Um, I assured her everything is okay. I just happen to care more about orthopedic comfort than people's opinions. No big deal. Don't judge my Crocs, okay? Try on a pair, okay? Uncomfortable truths. There is an uncomfortable truth that whether you like it or not, wearing a mask does not eliminate bad breath. We've had to face that this year, and I know that some of you, like myself, have tried to rush out of the house and realize, oh, maybe I can um, get away with it, only to realize that the mask does not in any way eliminate your bad breath. All it does is cause a cacophony of horrible smells that are now trapped and reflected back to you. It's not a good experience. It's an uncomfortable truth. And of course, that's a little bit lighthearted, but you know, the serious uh, side of things in the world that we live in right now, the uncomfortable truth of where our culture and where our country is, of where our world is at the moment, the existence of hate and racism and division and the pain that we see and maybe the pain that you've experienced. It is an uncomfortable truth when we look around and see the world that we live in. It's an uncomfortable truth that people aren't always who we think they are that they often inevitably let us down, that our hope is not meant to be in a politician, in a pastor, or any other person, period. But it's always meant to be in the person of Jesus. Sometimes it's an uncomfortable truth, but one we must embrace. And in the same way, it can be an uncomfortable truth to read this passage and know that anyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus, we must deny ourselves and carry the cross. It might seem like an uncomfortable truth, but I'm here to tell you today that there is beauty in it, that there is power in it, that there is hope to be found in it. So I wanna unpack this passage. I wanna present some thoughts to you today, and I know this, this concept of carrying your cross, it's often one that, that we kind of turn away from because it's uncomfortable. And so carrying a cross, it's something that we are called to do, something we cannot avoid. But what does that mean? I, I've titled this message, for those of you taking notes, uh, as, as you do, um, the title is Year of Yes. And my point is, is simply this idea. I know oftentimes we, we try to give a title to our year. We try to give a theme or a focus to our year. And I think um, with this being still close enough to the beginning of the year, we can still get away with it. But my encouragement is that we will make this a year where we decide to say yes. Not a year to, to necessarily saying yes to the blessing, yes to the good stuff. And that all oh, is great. And I believe God wants to bless us, but we cannot miss our opportunity to say yes to the cross of Jesus what it means to carry our cross. I want this to be a year where God, before anything else, I say yes, no matter what. That I say yes to carrying my cross, yes to whatever it means to follow Jesus. Now, some things to be uh, aware of. Carrying our cross does not mean um, being miserable, okay? It doesn't mean that we're meant to be miserable Christians. The world has enough grumpy Christians. Let's not add to the numbers, okay? Let's just be real. Uh, it doesn't mean suffering through the consequences of our own poor decisions, right? If I make a poor decision, um, that's on me, okay? If I choose to eat fast food at any other restaurant aside from Chick-fil-A, that's my fault. 
I have to live with the consequences. Carrying our cross doesn't mean allowing myself to develop a victimhood mindset where everything bad that happens to me is just the result of me having to carry my cross. No, once again, God is there to grace us and he's with us every step of the way. But too often I hear Christians say, well, I'm just carrying my cross. But the truth is what it means to carry our cross is it means unconditional obedience to Jesus, to his Holy Spirit, to his word, regardless of circumstances, regardless of opinions of people, regardless of our feelings, regardless of anything else going on around me and my circumstances, I am called to obedience. And Jesus says, you see that I'm the Messiah. You see that I'm the King. That's great. You want to follow me now, but make sure you follow me to the cross because to follow me and to be a disciple means that you will follow me and carry your cross. I know for, for so many this year, especially has been one of unforeseen trials of hurt and heartache. And, and Jesus is not in any way being insensitive to that when he calls us. You know, he says in John chapter 16, verse 33, uh, trials will come in this world. You will face tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That yes, life will be difficult at times, but he's calling us to follow him regardless of what it looks like. Following Jesus, even when it doesn't result in my business being blessed. Following Jesus, even when it seems difficult. Following Jesus, even when it causes me to possibly lose friends, family, or uh, influence in my life. And listen, I pray that none of that goes down the way that it is, but we need to know that carrying the cross is not about outcome. It's about obedience, regardless of where that leads. We see throughout the course of history, so many men and women that were willing to carry their cross even to the point of death simply to be obedient to Jesus. And listen, I'm not trying to be too heavy um, in this message right now, and I'm not trying to, to say that, oh, we, we need to be ready to die for our faith. I pray that it doesn't come to that, but once again, this is not about outcome. It is about obedience, and we are called to live in this place of obedience to the point of denying ourselves, even to the point of death. It's not about outcome, it's about obedience. It's about believing that even through trials, He is the God who has overcome. I want to use a, a quick picture that we have here in Scripture. And this passage is a very brief sentence. It's later on in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we see this man named Simon. Uh, he only gets one verse in all of Scripture, but I believe that this can give us a picture to maybe pull some, some very practical observations about what it looks like to carry our cross. And so in Mark chapter 15, verse 21, it says this. It says, A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry his cross. Now, I want to say that in many ways, this illustrates what it looks like for us to carry our cross. First, it mentions that Simon is from Cyrene. This was a, a place in, in northern Africa, and this is a, a place that was uh, known to have an established Jewish community. And what we believe and what we can uh, draw from Scripture and from context is that most likely, Simon was a man of Jewish faith. He was a man who was actually making a pilgrimage towards Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, which was happening this entire time. So this was actually a journey. Think about like a road trip. Simon had possibly been, been waiting for years to take because this journey that he took from Cyrene to Jerusalem, it would have been dangerous. It would have taken a tremendous amount of time and sacrifice. And so uh, Simon, he's been so intentional and he finally gets to this place. And now all of a sudden, Simon, while he's planning to go to the, fat, the Passover feast, is now all of a sudden, it says, compelled, meaning forced by the Roman guards to carry the cross. And what that does is that immediately immediately is a sacrifice. We, we immediately see that now because he has touched the cross of a criminal, Simon is no longer able to participate in the festivities of Passover. The entire reason that he came to Jerusalem, the entire reason that he made this voyage, he is now unable to do what he planned to do. He's unable to partake. And so we look at this passage, this man who has this experience carrying the cross, literally doing what Jesus just said a few chapters earlier. From this, we can draw a few conclusions about carrying our cross. That leads me to my first point, and I want to share with you three ways that I believe carrying our cross will change our lives. And the first is, it will cause uh, us to change our position. It will cause a change 
of position. You see, carrying our cross often requires us to reposition ourselves. You know, the truth is, I, I like positioning myself near Jesus during worship. Um, I enjoy positioning myself near Jesus when he's handing out blessing, right? When he's handing out healing, when he's doing all the good stuff. We love to be around the disciples. They were there when he fed the 4,000, when he fed the 5,000. They were there when he rose uh, Lazarus from the dead. They were there when he healed blind Bartimaeus. How amazing was it to be there, to be positioned next to him? And so sometimes positioning ourselves, it just looks like going where he goes. And that's awesome. But sometimes following Jesus will place us in front of a crowd. And sometimes it will place us at the making of a miracle. But there's one thing that it will always do is it will always place us at the cross. You see, following Jesus throughout um, the gospels, his followers were in front of lepers and kings. They went to funerals weddings and feasts. They were both with sinners and they were with saints. Those they agree with, those they did not, wherever they were, they were with Jesus. And sometimes, if I'm being honest, I sometimes can go with Jesus to the places I like, but maybe step back and say, oh no, I'll let you take that one, Jesus. I'll let you deal with that person because yeah, it's uncomfortable for me. Jesus says, no, I'm calling you to follow me wherever, wherever it is that I would go, A.W. Tozer, uh, he had this prayer when he first started into the ministry. And I love the, the, the way that he says this. It says, and now, O Lord of heaven and earth, I consecrate my remaining days to thee. Let them be many or few as thou will. Let me stand before the great or minister to the poor and lowly. That choice is not mine and I would not influence it if I could. I am thy servant to do thy will and that will is sweeter to me than position or riches or fame, and I choose it above all things on earth or in heaven. Are you willing to to position yourself wherever Jesus goes? And if it's in in places of influence, great. But as if it's in places with with hurting and, and downtrodden people, or if it's in places of suffering, if it's in places where maybe it's gonna call more from me than what I'm ready to give, are you willing to locate yourself, to position yourself next to Jesus in those moments. You know, it's really easy um, to be a fan of Tom Brady, uh, mainly because he's obviously the greatest quarterback to ever live. If you disagree, I'll give you a moment, gather your composure, we'll pray for you after service, it's fine. Um, Far more difficult to be a follower of Tom Brady. What I mean by that is it's easy to cheer him on. It's way more difficult uh, to do what he does to go where he goes, to eat what he eats, to train where he trains and when he trains. And in the same way, it is really easy for me to to maybe be a fan of Jesus, to think he was a good guy, a good teacher, to tune in online. But he did not come to this earth to take on the principalities of darkness and the rulers of this earth, to die on a cross, to overcome death and be resurrected as the first fruits of that which we will inherit so that he can have a cheering section. No, he died and he defeated death so that he could have followers, people that wouldn't just cheer from our our sidelines or from our our couch, but people that would say, I'm in. Wherever you go, Jesus, I want to go. Whoever you're speaking to, Jesus, I want to be there. I want to speak. I want to pastor. I want to minister to those that you're ministering to. If Jesus goes to the hurting, I want to go to the hurting. If Jesus is going to the people I don't agree with and don't like that much, I want to go there. And I want to go there with the heart of Christ, not with the heart of my own bitterness or anger anger or frustration, but to go there, embracing who Jesus is and representing him to the fullest of my ability. You know, we realize that the positioning of Simon, uh, that was not his choice. He did not choose um, to take on the cross. And sometimes carrying our cross in the moments that we find ourselves positioned in those difficult places, uh, sometimes it's not our choosing. But can I encourage you to embrace those moments? Maybe you didn't choose to be in the job that you're in. You just said yes to it. It was the opportunity. Your roles got shifted. Or maybe you didn't choose to be in the living situation that you're in right now. Maybe you did not choose um, the conflict that you found yourself in the middle of. But can I encourage you to continually follow Jesus because it's actually sometimes in those moments that God brings out the best, that God blesses us, that it's in the midst of the burden that God actually brings the greatest blessings. I remember when I was uh, young and, and, and had just recently given my life to Jesus, I was 
interested in being involved in the church that I was a part of at the time. However, I kept procrastinating and kept putting it off. I kept saying, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to the youth pastor and just see maybe if he needs some help or see if I can get involved and volunteer. And my parents were aware of this and I kept putting it off and putting it off. And I remember my dad was going to drop something off at the church one day and I was with him. He said, hey, he's like, you said you wanted to talk to the youth pastor. Would you like to talk to him today? I'm going in, he'll be in there, you can say something. And I said, no, nah, I'm, I'm good. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll probably talk to him another time. I don't wanna bother him. And I remember I walked in with my dad and my dad was saying something. He saw the youth pastor and as soon as he saw him, he said, hey, it's good to see you. Um, hey, my son wanted to talk to you about something. He wanted to talk to you about volunteering and possibly going to this youth camp and helping out in any way that he can. And I remember being so frustrated because I was suddenly compelled. This was not my choice, but I was compelled to step out and to carry my cross in some way or another, to step into maybe the uncomfortable part of following Jesus and to serving. From there, I went on to, to stack chairs. That was my, my main role within youth ministry was I set out the chairs every single night, made sure they were perfectly lined up, made sure they were spaced, set up the, the area so that the young people um, at that time could come in and experience the presence of God. And it was so simple. And I'm so grateful for somebody who compelled me and maybe you did not choose where you're at or you did not choose the cross that you're currently carrying, but we serve a God who is able to work all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So the more that I changed my position, suddenly I went from just seeing that as an opportunity to stack chairs and to sit up chairs and suddenly I saw the effect that it was having because once I changed my position, it changed my perspective. My second point, for, for carrying our cross is, is it causes us to have a change of perspective. I want to think about Simon for a moment, how being forced to carry the cross would have changed not only his position, okay? His position was he was a passerby, which means he was not a follower of Jesus. He most likely was just simply on his way somewhere else. However, in that moment, he happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, or as we see now, the right place at the right time. He was chosen, he changed his position, and suddenly that would have absolutely changed his perspective and how he saw the events of Jesus and the cross. And we watch the disciples following Jesus. We see very clearly that they were seeing a different perspective than they were used to. You see, following Jesus, they suddenly were next to the leper. It gives you a different perspective when you're around people who are in pain going through loneliness. Being next to the hurting gives you a different perspective. Being next to the sinful and the outcast gives us a different perspective. You know, being next to people that we disagree with will change our perspective. And can I tell you for a moment, maybe envision that person that you so passionately disagree with. I'm not asking you to do that so that you can uh, raise your blood pressure. I'm asking you to do that, to stop for a moment and recognize that they too are made in the image of God that they too have the opportunity to be chosen, that they too have the opportunity to follow, just like these two disciples. We need to change our perspective. I'm not saying you have to change your opinion. I'm not saying you have to change your beliefs or what you hold when it comes to the world around us, when it comes to politics, ideology, or anything. That's not what I'm talking about right now. But we absolutely have to change our perspective on how we view one another, how we view our Christian brothers and sisters. Will we choose to see them as image bearers or will we choose to see them as opposition? We need a, a, a change of perspective. God calls Abraham out of his tent in Genesis 15 because he needs a change in perspective. We all need a change in perspective. Go ahead and write it in the chat. Say it out loud. Say, I need to change my perspective. It's a good thing to say. I wanna take a moment and take some creative liberty, if you will, with Simon and his story. We see his son's name, we see his name mentioned. I said that earlier, the reason his name and the reason his son's name was mentioned is because most likely the early believers that were receiving this gospel of Mark would have known who they were. And so what this indicates is that most likely, although we don't know for sure, most likely his sons, Alexander and Rufus, would have gone on to be members of the church possibly even key figures within the church, that Simon himself, it looks like there's a, a strong possibility, would have gone on to be a believer and follower of Jesus, that he goes from simply being a passerby to being a believer. And can you imagine for just a moment how that would have changed his perspective? 
changed his perspective of what he was doing. You see, knowing Jesus changes our perspective. It changes everything about how we see the world. Can I tell you, carrying our cross as we head into 2021, I wanna be committed to changing my perspective, to not seeing the world the way the world sees it to not seeing culture the way the world sees it, but to see it through the eyes of Jesus, to see it through the reality of who Jesus is. You see, if I start to see carrying the cross through the eyes of the world, that's an indicator that I need to go back. I need to remind my soul of who Jesus is, create fresh room in my life to encounter him, have this contrast of, of how the world sees things, but how God sees things. You see, in a world that is all about what we can get, Paul reminds us of Jesus' words in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, that it's better to give than to receive. We see in Matthew chapter 20, verse 16, Jesus reminds us that though the world pushes to be first, that actually the first shall be last and the last shall be first. In a world that is pursuing greatness by any means necessary, Jesus reminds us in Matthew chapter 20, verse 27 through 28, that if we wanna be great, then we should be servants. In a world that says, show me what you have done. Show me what you can do. We see Paul reminding us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where he says, I'll show you what he has done. I'm not going to boast about what I've done. I'm going to boast about what he has done in my life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, we see that reminder for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. You see, when the world looks at the cross, they see foolishness. And there is a possibility that the world around us may look at our faith, may look at us confessing Jesus as Lord and simply say that it's foolishness. But it says to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Imagine how we could change our perspective if we simply chose to, to see through the cross, see through the perspective that Jesus gives us, the world around us. Imagine how it would have changed Simon's perspective. Simon gets to the cross and, and hands it off. And from that moment, his perspective, uh, most likely, let's assume immediately, he probably was a little bit frustrated. I mean, he's just missed out on everything that he has come to Jerusalem for. He no longer can be a part of the feast because he's ritualistically considered unclean. That not only that, he was embarrassed by what he had to do. This man who he doesn't even know, he had to carry his cross. This man apparently would have been a sinner, would have been a criminal. This was a great dishonor. It would have been frustrating. But then suddenly, I imagine his perspective would have shifted when he came to really know who Jesus was. Suddenly, when you realize that you were just carrying the cross of Jesus, you look at it a lot different. What once was a burden, suddenly it's seen differently. It's seen as a blessing. Instead of seeing the cross as an inconvenience, I imagine Simon, if he would have been a follower of Jesus, suddenly would have said, that was the greatest honor that I could ever be a part of. Suddenly what was once a burden, you see it as a blessing. Suddenly what once was an inconvenience becomes the greatest honor of your life. Suddenly what once was viewed as foolishness is an opportunity for faithfulness. Suddenly something that cut you off from the world, you now see it as a moment where you realized you were accepted by the God of heaven. Something that maybe you thought of as being heavy. Suddenly your, your, your mind is focused on the grace and the strength that you found to carry it and to, to do this honor that you had before you to carry the cross. And acknowledge the fact that the entire time you did it, your Savior was right next to you. Can I tell you that as we carry our cross, Jesus is right there, just like he was with Simon. While Simon carried the cross, Jesus was with him step for step. What once was something that Simon would have tried to avoid, as a believer now would have become something he would have cherished. Have you ever had a moment that you wish you could go back to? I can imagine so many ways that Simon would have wished that he could have gone back to that moment that moment where he carried the cross to speak to Jesus, to say thank you, to, to say all the things that he wanted to say, to look into his eyes, to take in the moment and absorb it as much as he could have, to relish in the honor that for even just a small moment, he could have the opportunity to lighten the burden of his Savior. You see, the reality of who Jesus is causes us to see the cross completely different. It causes us to see this as a blessing. The things that we do in ministering, the things that we do in, in loving the people in our world, it is not a burden. When we see it through the eyes of Jesus, suddenly we see it as a blessing. You see, knowing Jesus wouldn't have just changed his perspective. It would have changed his focus. Knowing Jesus and knowing who he was 
would have eventually led Simon to the Old Testament scriptures in Isaiah 53, a prophetic passage that speaks of the Messiah, that speaks of Jesus. And it says this, it says in verse four, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, Simon would have read that passage, no doubt, or maybe it was read one day in, in, in synagogue and, and maybe he was there and, and I wonder if it was immediate or I wonder if it was weeks or years or, or months down the road, but I imagine there would have been this moment where he would have been reading Isaiah 53, that he was crushed for our iniquities, that he was pierced for our transgressions and suddenly Simon would have realized that this moment that he cherished, this moment that he had this encounter with this Jesus of Nazareth, this Jesus who is in fact our Messiah, our Savior, our King, that this moment was not a moment where Simon carried Jesus' cross. It was a moment where Simon carried his own cross. Because you see, Jesus, he did not die on his cross. He died on my cross. He died on Simon's cross. Suddenly, when you realize that, suddenly your focus shifts and suddenly Simon's focus of the entire story, I imagine he would have had moments where maybe he was recollecting and telling people about, yeah, have you heard about the time where I carried Jesus' cross? Uh, have you heard about the time? Yeah, it was pretty heavy. I took it upon my shoulders. It was awesome. I mean, you know, got it there, did the job. But once he realizes what Jesus has done, I promise you the focus would not have been on where Jesus passes the cross off to Simon. He would have focused on the part when he gets to the end of the road where suddenly Simon has to pass his cross back over to Jesus. Because the reality is Simon deserved it. The reality is I deserve it. We deserve it because the Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the Bible also says, the Bible says that he willingly laid down his life so that we can know freedom and forgiveness. He would have got to this point as he focused, as he, as he shifted his focus, as he, he switched the cross and, and gave it over to Jesus. The reality was that, that Simon had gotten to a point where he could no longer suffice. Okay, Simon could carry the cross up until that point, but now there has to be a payment. Now there has to be something that is done. And can I tell you right now, Simon could not pay the penalty for our sin. Simon was unworthy and he was unable. And sometimes when we're carrying our cross, we need to understand that there has to be a change of possession because we get to a point where we cannot do it in our own strength. I cannot live this life. I cannot pursue my calling. I cannot live out a life of obedience in my own strength. There comes a point just like Simon where I have to hand it over because you see Simon gets to the point where he is not able and he is not worthy. And can I tell you today that there is no one who is able, there is no one who is worthy, who is able to save your life, to set you free, to give you a passion and a purpose that only God himself has designed for you, that no one is able, no one is worthy as you look around you. There is one who is worthy, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus. He is worthy and he is able, and he was able to step into that moment, to take the cross from Simon, to pay for the debt of our sins. And can I tell you today that as you're carrying your cross and when you feel like you can't make it anymore, that he is worthy and he is able to take the weight of the cross. So we can't just shift our perspective or change our perspective, change our position, but we have to change possession as we carry the cross and as we feel the weight, we carry it, but then we pass it on to Jesus. Jesus who says, cast your cares upon me, cast your anxieties upon me. The Jesus who says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. In our own ability, we cannot do it, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, it says, when we are weak, he is strong. Now maybe at this point, I understand it all still seems overwhelming and like many, people and like myself, oftentimes you think, yeah, I want to carry my cross. I just don't know if I'm cut out for it. Can I tell you that carrying our cross is not for extreme Christians. It's not for those who have more faith than others. It's not for those who are more committed. That's not what drives us to carry our cross. 
You know, the truth is in, in Mark chapter eight, verse 38, at the end of that passage that we read at the beginning, it's kind of intense. It says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words and is in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. It's intense and you think, man, I, I guess, okay, I, I don't feel comfortable carrying my cross. I don't know if I can do it, um, but I guess I will because I'm afraid not to. You know, I, I've been married to my wife and she is, the most lovely woman on the face of the planet. And can I tell you, in saying that though, I am afraid of forgetting our anniversary. Okay, I just wanna throw it out there. It has nothing to do um, with her not being the amazingly kind and sweet wife that she is. It has everything to do with wisdom. I'm afraid of missing our anniversary, but here's the thing, I don't celebrate it out of fear. I celebrate my anniversary, July 22nd. 2012. I celebrate that because of love and adoration for my wife. And can I tell you that the cross is not something that we do out of fear. Carrying our cross is not something we do out of obligation. It is something that we do as a love response to our Savior because we have so encountered his love in a way that has changed our lives. I promise you, Simon, from that moment forward, he would have carried his cross, not because he had to, not because he was afraid not to, but because he witnessed Jesus carrying his cross, because he saw the love and the fire in his eyes, because he saw that he was accepted, because he saw the depth to which Jesus would go to make sure that we had forgiveness and salvation. He would have done it out of a love response. We see it all throughout the scriptures that we see disciples willingly being beaten, willingly being pushed into the point of death not because they're trying to earn their Christian badge, but because they're so enraptured with the love of God that they have experienced. You see, we can't outlove Jesus. 1 John 19, verse 19 says, we love because he first loved us. We love in response. So my, my encouragement for us as we say yes to Jesus is not to muster our strength and to go carry our cross. Now, we, we absolutely must carry our cross. It's a command. But we do so driven by love as a love response of fixing our eyes on Jesus, as it says in Hebrews chapter 12. Fixing our eyes on the person of Jesus and responding to his love that he has shared and his love that he has showered on us. It's my prayer for us. It's my prayer for our church. It's my prayer for myself is that we would respond in love. That we would say yes, that this would be the year of yes. And I want to take a moment right now if um, you're with us and maybe you've never said yes to Jesus. And the truth is, as we mentioned earlier, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinful and broken individuals regardless of what our lives look like. But the good news is that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus, his one and only son, to die on a cross, this cross that we've been talking about, so that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the grave, that we shall have eternal life. We shall be saved. And so I want to invite you to say this prayer with us and uh, make this decision right now where you're at, in your car, at your home, in your office, wherever you're viewing, to make this decision in your heart for the first time to respond to the love of Jesus that has been poured out for all the world. So let's say this prayer together. Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died for me. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I ask that you make me new. You teach me to follow you all the days of my life. I wanna carry my cross. I wanna follow you in faithfulness trust and obedience, no matter what comes my way. Thank you for loving me and teach me to love you more every day of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Matt, for that incredible and timely word. What a beautiful reminder that Jesus carries our cross. I wanna encourage you to take one point or one verse that spoke to you and apply that to your week and make sure you share the link with family and friends. 
If you're with us during the 10 a.m., you can click on the link below and it'll direct you to our website where you can chat with one of our pastoral staff. If you'd like to receive prayer or you have any questions about our church, our pastoral team would love to connect with you right after this service. Also, if you'd like, you can click on the link below for staff chats during the week. And as a reminder, if you'd like to give and continue building our house, click on the link below in the description. Well, church, we love you. Remember to hit that subscribe button, share the link with your family and friends, and see you next Sunday, 10 a.m. or on demand. Your love so deep is washing over me. Your face is all I you are my everything Jesus Christ You are my one desire Lord, in my only cry To know you I breathe you